We find ourselves here, at the beginning. Another tale, another chapter. The tower stood tall once. It held the nobility of the country, and within it there were still many secrets and power. There were tales of the wealth and magical artifacts within its crumbling and rotted walls. But its treasures were difficult for the taking. There were shapes drifting through the darkened rooms, and monsters of wing and claw and vile poison standing watch of the halls and corridors. They had guarded the hoard and kept it both safe from those who would take it from the tower, and kept those outside safe from the horrors the treasure would bring. Among all the items of power hidden, tucked away within the tower's many rooms, there lay one which would make the rest sit forgotten. It was said the smith who crafted it held a power given by the ancient gods before the kings and queens and emperors ever dreamed themselves into existence. It was a crown of gold, and inlaid in its center sat a polished spike of jade, which held the spirit of its crafter, protecting the crown from harm. A stranger walked the lands from the furthest shores of the east until it finally came to a town and what would become Germany. There the stranger told its tale of the tower and the crown and the beasts who guarded it. The very same crown cursed the stranger when his greed had become too great. Now spreading the tale of the crown was his penance. For the crown sought an owner. It needed the world to know its strength and its viciousness. But the monsters would not let the strange traveler or anyone before him steal it. One night, a man named Linhart walked through Hamburg looking for something stiff to drink. Life weighed hard on him. He was a warrior relegated to heavy construction work. To feed himself and his family, he helped in repairs and maintenance of the great Hamburg Cathedral, but that was long since finished. The church's money had made them fat and happy, but Linhart needed glory. The stranger stepped into the bar looking the part of a wanderer, but with an ornate pair of piped leather braces on his forearms. They held Linhart's gaze. The stranger knew he needn't confront Linhart, and the questioning gaze would bring him out, eventually. Linhart couldn't contain himself long, and sat next to the wanderer at the round corner table. He placed his own drink down, and the wood creaked and rocked unevenly on its own legs. Tell me, stranger, where did you get such exquisite protection? These were a gift, the man said from under his cloak. He turned himself to face Linhart more fully and added in a whisper, A gift from the tower. Nine months to the day later, Linhart crested a small rise some 8,000 kilometers from the Hamburg Tavern. His pack was near empty. His coin purse was considerably lighter. But as he looked out from the hilltop, the sight brought a smile to his face. The stranger's tale offered him money, power, and glory, all things Linhart felt he needed more than the air in his lungs. The work on the cathedral had given him enough of a nest for his wife and young daughter to feel comfortable while he went out to the tower. Linhart had left the very next morning and set out with sharpened blades and a pack of food. He hired himself out to merchants traveling along the Silk Road once he reached Venice and when they turned around, he pressed on. Linhart went through the mountain passes in the Himalayas and crossed south of the Gobi Desert into China. There, he finally turned north to the border of Mongolia. Now as he stood out as the lone speck of life on the hilltop, Linhart saw the tower before him, off in the distance. The tower, even in a crumbling and derelict state, stood out from all the others Linhart had seen on his journey. He crossed the open field and approached the tower's circled wall. The tower had a tiered roof, similar to many of the ones Linhart had seen since entering China. This building was torn from its time and perhaps its place. The stranger had warned that if Linhart wanted the real treasure, he should venture into the ground and not up into its heights. The wall on the western side had long since fallen with heavy stones now laying on the grass and covered in dark green moss. Linhart stepped around the debris at the bailey of the mysterious tower. He tugged his axe free and used the flat of its head to lever open a half rotted wooden door. The thing fell from its hinges in an echoing clatter. Linhart froze, 
half expecting monsters to jump out of the shadows and attack him. Nothing happened, and Linhart grew bolder as he stepped towards the interior of the tower and away from the light. Weeds grew from the cracks between flagstones and the tower's floor, and light drifted in through the broken door. Stairs wound up into the upper floors and a spiral off to Linhart's right. He looked up towards those stairs, and spied a few coins sitting on the ground in front of them, their shine glinting through the tarnish of age and neglect. Linhart gripped his axe tighter in his hand, smelling a trap. Tearing his gaze from the coins, he looked deeper into the interior of the main room. There was a dried-up stone fountain dominating the center of the room, with a pair of double doors behind it. The doors were slightly ajar, with a soft light coming from behind them. Linhard moved silent and quick to the door and peeked around it. The light came from a circular hole in the wall's side, too rough to be a window. The remains of something inhuman lay under the shaft of light. Linhard's quick glance made out four gigantic femur bones and a skull full of fangs the size of his axe. If there were any other live ones here, he wouldn't have the reach to keep them away from his vitals. Linhart dropped the axe silently back into its leather carrier and drew his sword from the scabbard on his opposite side. His ambidexterity was one of the main reasons Linhart had survived his violent youth. Moving into the room was the only thing that saved Linhart from the monster's attack. It was twice the size of a tiger, but had a similar shape to its clawed and fanged form. The beast had spotted Linhart when he had stepped across the gap in the wall and stalked up behind him. It pounced just as he moved into the room, and the rotten door burst into soft splinters, mixing with rusted metal banding. Linhart spun and brought his sword up across his body, shielding his eyes from the flying debris. He saw the monster and knew immediately it was the same as the skeleton behind him. It coiled its hind legs to pounce at him again, and there wasn't anything in the room to protect him this time. Instead, Linhart crouched slightly with his sword held in front of him, point up. When the attack came, claws flashed out and shone in the rays of weak light coming in from the open wall. Linhart dove to the right, keeping the sword in his left arm centered where he hoped the creature's heart and lungs would be. It was an edged weapon, no good for stabbing, and the point caught the rib of the thing's underbelly. The strike almost tore the sword from his hand and did no actual damage to the strange tiger. Linhart slid further to his right, trying to get to the thing's flank. It spun in place to face him, but not quickly enough. Linhart rained down a series of quick hammering blows with the pommel of the sword into the top of the beast's skull, stunning it and making it howl in frustration. That howl initiated a response as old and as wicked as Linhart had ever heard. A scream sharp enough to kill even an Irish banshee buzzed through the air and the stones of the tower rocked and groaned in response. If the tiger Linhart faced could smile, it would have, and its fangs snapped in excitement. He heard then the deep thudding of heavy metal boots on the stone of the upper floors. His trial approached. He would either beat it and win his glory, or never leave this place. The tiger lunged at him, snapping its massive jaws at his midsection. Linhart jumped backward and swiped his sword down in a crescent-shaped slash. It caught the monster on the side of its neck and there, finally, drew blood. The monster howled again, this time in pain and rage. It jumped at him again as blood freely pumped out of the wound in its neck. Linhart smashed his pommel down at the thing's head again, but this time he missed. The tiger had used a feint and instead barreled into him knocking Linhart to the flagstone floor. There, it brought its hind legs to bear, levering its forward shoulder to pin him to the ground. The claws in his back legs kicked and slashed at his hide. Linhart grunted in pain as he felt his fiery blood pour from a wound on his right leg. His sword saved him, as he used its sharp forward edge as a fulcrum to push the monstrous tiger off him and the last of its strength left it through the wound in its neck while it tried to leap back atop him. It failed and died on the floor next to its skeletal partner. 
there was no time to breathe or bandage his wounded leg, despite the deep gash the tiger had left on his calf. The thudding from above had stopped. A weathered skull covered in floating wisps of thin white hair stared out from under the heavy caged helmet of the thing standing before Linhart. It left a still sword in salute, brief and formal, before drawing a stiletto dagger from a sheath on its other side. Linhart grimaced and pressed his right hand into the smooth wood of his axe's grip. The monstrous shade creaked in its armor, but it moved swiftly. It brought the sword downward at Linhart's vitals in a vertical slash. Linhart caught the blow and directed the blade to the side with his own, but it was only its leading attack. The real danger laid in the stiletto dagger, knifing straight through Linhart's guard, aiming for his midsection. Linhart disengaged and jumped back, swiping the back of his axe head down in a crescent, driving his attacker's second blade wide. He knew he was vulnerable, as it swept both his weapons out from his body. He wasn't an amateur. The thing's next attack would be to come in close, using its unnaturally long reach and speed to outdistance Linhart. It did just that. But Linhart, anticipating the attack, continued backward causing the vile thing to overextend itself. He then sidestepped the stiletto to the outside. It deftly swung it in a wide slash, but a stiletto is forged to pierce, or to slash. It couldn't get enough speed to even bludgeon Linhart, and it regretted its attempt immediately when Linhart's sword swing connected perfectly in the joint of his armor at the elbow. The sword sheared through the soft padding between the metal plates. He felt the crunch of bone in the thing's arm went limp dropping the dagger clattering onto the stone tiled floor. It screeched and took a wild overhand chop at Linhart, crossing its own body to protect the wound. He ducked the blow and then lashed out with a heavy kick to its armored chest. Linhart's boot connected with the monster's crossed arms instead of his chest. It opened, pushed back against his foot, and flung him sprawling into the corner of the room. Linhart landed on his wounded leg and felt the burning pain fizz in his brain clouding his vision as the monster advanced. The shade altered its grip on the sword as it moved in, preparing to stab down and finish the man. Linhart threw his axe at the shade, making it deflect the weapon which glanced off his halberg. It gave Linhart the breath of time he needed to come up into a crouch, blood staining his pan leg. Then, ignoring the pain, he shot forward in a leap. Linhart grabbed the shade by the crease in its armor at the neck, and drove his sword straight between the slits in the caged helmet and into his empty skull. Lenhart bound his cut leg with a strip of cloth and dabbed at the split lip from when the shade threw him to the ground. He had done well for himself, with no new dangers presenting themselves. He decided it was high time to look around. There was a second door in the back of the room, and after only a little caution, Lenhart swung it open. Instead of opening into another room, he looked down at a flight of dusty stone steps, heading off into the thick darkness and stale air. Lenhard stood completely still and listened for a full minute, hoping both that he heard something and that he wouldn't. If something was down there, it was utterly silent, would kill him easily enough. But it could just as easily be an empty stairwell down into the bowels of the tower. He knew he wouldn't be able to see his hand in front of his face if he went down there but the stranger's words echoed around in Linhart's head. He had given up nine months of his life to get here, and had come too far to back down now. Rummaging around in his small pack, he pulled out a half-spent candle in his flint. Striking the flint with his axe head, sent sparks scattering away and right onto the wick of the small candle. It wasn't much, and it wouldn't last long, but the paltry light would have to do. Linhart checked his bandages, picked up his sword from the ground and sheathed it, and reslung his pack. With the candle in his left hand and his axe in his right, Linhart descended into the murky stairwell. The stairs felt as though they would continue forever. Linhart swore he had gone down more than a dozen floors before finally the ground leveled out. He kneeled down and looked at the dust on the flagstones. There were two other sets of boot prints. They appeared the same, but went in opposite directions. There was a long hallway stretching out in front of Linhart, 
The closed door spaced out on both sides. Gripping his candle tight and lifting it higher, Leonard followed the dusty bootprints deeper into the hallway. He passed the doors nearest the exit, and after a few strides he caught sight of something shining and glimmering from his weak candlelight on the door, setting just a jar off to his left. He moved to the door and pushed it open. It groaned, and its echoes reverberated up and down the hallway, making Linhart freeze in place. Nothing stirred, and eventually his greed overpowered his fear. The door led to a bedroom with a large headboard supporting the remnants of a long rotted mattress. Laying on the ground where the bed would have been, Linhart spotted what had bent his attention. There was a human skeleton with a necklace of emeralds around its throat. That single piece of joy would have paid for his house and all the others on the street. He carefully unclasped it from the skeleton and put it into his pack. In the next room he stopped in, Lenard found another skeleton wearing the tatters of once exquisite clothes. Now, they were only good at making a proper torch. He took them and dribbled a little oil from a skein out of the cloth, then wrapping it around a piece of wood broken from a bedpost. Lenard held the candle to the soaked cloth. It caught immediately and illuminated far more than the tiny light had before. He now saw there was an end to the hallway, and Linhart had almost made it all the way already. The pair of double doors banded in metal strips and gold filigree contrasted with itself, already partly open, and the dusty boot prints led straight up to them, but Linhart couldn't see what lay beyond them. Slipping through the cracked doors was easy enough, and he did so without making a noise. Once on the other side, Linhart realized he should have bothered with all the caution. It was a magnificent hall, with pillars and stone tables lining the walls. The floor was littered with skeletons, some sitting at tables, others laying out in the middle of the floor, as though they had walked in and simply stopped living. It was an odd tableau, but not a dangerous one. Every one of them wore pounds of elaborate and expensive jewellery, but at the end of the hall, there was a throne where another skeleton sat, propping up its head with its hand as though deep in thought. The torchlight gleamed off the golden crown ringing his skull, a large jade spike placed in its center. Linhard felt compelled forward, pulled toward that throne and the jade and the crown. Before he knew it, he was standing in front of the ancient dead ruler. He stared hard into the depths of the stone's reflected torchlight. Shapes moved under its surface, reflections of the fire in his hand. Linhart put his torch down and his axe back in the loop in his belt. Then, ever so gently, he reached up and placed his hands on the sides of the crown. The gold felt cool under his touch. A low moan came from behind him. It was sudden, and he knew he was no longer alone in the chamber. Linhart took the crown from the empty skull and turned to face the things who followed him into the hall. The one requests judgment from the many. Who are you? Linhart asked, unable to see where the voice came from. I am the many. It replied in a raspy cough, as though it forced the words from a throat unaccustomed to speech. And the bones rattled in the hall. It wasn't the rattle of someone moving them out of the way as they walked in like Linhart did. No. Every bone in the hall rattled in a deafening cacophony. Then, all at once, they flung together into a writhing mass of bones, clattering into one another, shifting and attaching themselves into a form born of nightmares. A moment later, a skeleton stood in front of Linhart. It towered over him, stooping over to keep from brushing the ceiling. Four arms held the pillars on the sides of the chamber, a purple light emitted from the eye sockets of the skull, and Linhart took an involuntary step backwards, his boot touching the foot of the skeletal ruler sitting on the throne. It was the only bones that hadn't moved. Linhart heard a soft breath, a sigh escape from the bones behind him. You. 
it said. Finally. Then, with an exhalation of Eldritch power, they dissolved into the air. Linhart didn't waste another second. Holding his trophy tight in his hand, he ran from the room, leaving his torch forgotten on the ground of the tower's throne. Linhart scrambled out through the crumbling wall ringing the tower. The crown of the rotted king held white-knuckled in his grip. His eyes were wide and earnest in their search for a pursuit that wasn't there. The man ran from the tower and didn't stop until he crested the next hilltop. Linhart had his treasure, and now he had to make good on his escape. Leaning down and panting with his hands resting on his knees, Linhart finally risked a glance back at the tower. His vision fizzed from the exertion, but he swore he could just make out a towering figure standing at the gate, looking back at him. Linhart shook himself and wiped the sweat from his face. When he looked back, there was only the lonely tower, rising out of the rolling hills on the borders of Mongolia. Days passed, and Linhart made his way back towards civilization. He stayed in a small inn for merchants in the city of Turfan. The memory of the tiger in the shade flashed in his mind each night he had slept on the road, and he awoke in cold sweat each morning. Linhart crashed into the rough mattress of his rented room. He turned over onto his back and stared off into the raining night through an open window. A storm had rolled in while he'd been downstairs drinking his nightmares away, but he could just make out a figure standing across the street below him. It was a young woman, coughing and shaking from a sickness that racked her body. Sores covered her in deep red and ugly purple that Linhart could even see clearly from his bed. The next morning, Linhart made his way out the westward gate, and before the day ended, he had sold his sword to protect a merchant caravan heading to Rome. They knew nothing of the precious treasure he kept hidden in his pack. Each night they made their way steadily closer to his home, and each night the images chased him through his dreams. Always closer at hand than the night before, they saw fewer people on the roads and more filling the hospital sick beds with violent fevers and pus-filled bruises. These signs always preceded death and the wailing of their loved ones. By the time months had passed and the company arrived in Tripoli, where they had chartered a ship to take them onward, some of the Linhart's treasure had paid for food, liquor, and vital supplies. Each time he traded a piece of gold away, he felt the thieving masses of the walking half-dead nip a step closer to his heels. When they began their journey, the merchant company had numbered 112 strong, but now a paltry 36 remained. Most of them had gotten sick, and the company left them behind to stop the spread of the sickness within the group. Through it all, despite what Linhart had traded, he kept his profits tucked away deep in his pack. He told none of the others he held more money than the entire company's worth, and had slipped away each time he wanted to make an exchange. Not once did Linhart ever consider trading the crown. They boarded the ship bound for Rome and not two days out to sea, they found a pair of crewmates writhing in their bunks, sick with fever and scratching at bloody spots on their arms. The Mediterranean did take the company's ship in gentle arms, and the crew struggled to keep it afloat on weakening arms until, at last, Linhart was the last living soul aboard. He had learned much of sailing on both his journey to the tower and the trip back. But even if he were a master, he couldn't have kept the sheets tight and the course true. In either a fit of melancholy or sheer dehydration, Linhart stood at the bow of the ship. The sails flapped in the cool breeze as he pitched himself forward off the deck and into the waters. He had hit his head when the keel passed over him, and he knew no more. Linhart came to his senses, washed ashore on a beach on one of the western Greek islands. He did not understand how he came to be there, or where any of his gear was. He didn't know how he yet lived, and, through it all, he somehow still had the gold crown in his waterlogged pack. It was the sole item there. The man struggled to his feet. His money was gone and his food was spoiled. Resigned, Linhart trudged north towards a small village, 
overlooking cliffs where he could see trails of smoke, tracing lazy spirals up into the sky. Within an hour, Linhart emerged from the sand and the weeds onto the main road to the village and there, he smelled the scent of rot. Somehow the sickness plaguing his westward journey had beaten him, even here. The village was a ghost town. Linhart saw the place sat abandoned with piles of corpses burning in the square. A macabre image of grief and a desperate attempt to stop the spread. The story continued on in the next village, and Linhart resorted to eating the weeds on the side of the road in a vain plea to stop the pangs of hunger. He became sick within a dozen paces, and as he kneeled, shuddering as the nauseous waves racked his body, he glanced back towards the sea. There, off in the distance as far to the south and west, he could just make out a figure. It stood impossibly tall, and its four skeletal arms gave him a grim salute. Linhart couldn't die with the others, nor could he find sanctuary or respite from then on. He travelled back to his home as a cursed man. Many times over he tried to trade away his last possession, the jade-spiked gold crown for food or clothing. The exchanges always went well, and he ate and clothed himself with his profit. But the next morning, the food was empty in his belly again, the clothes were moth-ridden, and the crown was back in his pack. He arrived back home in Hamburg to find his family had fallen ill from the plague while he had struggled to cross the Alps. When he returned, they had already passed on. Linhard would have cried if he had the water for tears, and he would have screamed if he had the energy for sorrow. The cursed man buried his family and walked out of town. He would outrun this plague. It could not make it to the ends of the earth, but Linhart could. A small ferry carried him through the crossing to England where he hoped he could hide, and he did for a time. Until one night, Linhart lay next to a gutter, ignoring the thunder and shivering in the icy rain sliding down the back of his neck. A shade stepped up in front of him. Are you not ready? A young girl's voice asked. Go away! Linhart shouted. Do you not recognize me, father? The voice pressed. The girl kneeled down next to him, and he shrunk back as her face came into focus. Her hair lay in wet clumps on the side of her head, and her fingers were decaying as they reached out to him. How? he asked. I buried you and your mother months ago. Then understanding fell upon him like a cloak pressing him into its heavy folds as she spoke. Linhart heard the words as she uttered them. The many request an audience with the one, she said. Then the words bubbled up out of him in an anguished cry. You, he said. Finally. Then he reached down into the mud and found the crown laying there, untouched from the dirt. He held it up to her. Take it. Take it from me. Free me from this hell. He pleaded. His daughter smiled a wan smile and took the crown from him. Then, gently, as anyone ever could, she lifted it and placed it upon Linhart's head. The crown spent the life from Linhart's body from the instant it touched his temples. Even then, he remained. The curse bound his consciousness to the plane of the living. Out of the dark storm, the towering figure with forearms cradled Linhart's body, lifting it and walking back out into the gloom. The construct of the many walked for months through countries, decimated by what historians would call the Black Death. Each of the dead whom the construct passed woke, stood on their own, and as though called forward, they followed it back to the tower. Finally, after gripping the whole of the continent and more, in its vile, miasmatic hands, the rats died out, and the plague stopped its spread. Linhard saw the landscape change as the construct carried his body, 
and eventually you recognize the hilltop where the tower still sat waiting for its new prisoner. There in its depths, the construct placed Linhart down on the throne and the mantle of its power locked him within its walls. The skeletons stopped their shambling march and found new resting places within the tower, guarding its treasures and its ruler. There, Linhart sat, with the never-ceasing and ever-growing undead army at his every call. He had more power than even the ancient beings, for none had ever spread their power as far or as wide as Linhart. The world's deadliest army slept dormant, kept in check by its king's iron will to never again let its pestilence cause the pain it once did. It did not move, but he remembered every second of his new undeath, until one day, a strange creature came to the tower with an offer. Linhart finally awoke the writhing mass of the many, and together, they left the tower to do battle against the Mortis Maledictum. And thus, the story is ended. The tale told. The chapter closed.